My first two videos on YouTube dealt with the Roman army, which is an area I know the most about, but philosophy, especially Greek philosophy, is an area that has easily influenced my views and even life far more than Roman military studies, as interesting as that topic may be. Today I will be discussing the views of Noam Chomsky and Aristotle, two brilliant polymaths who need no introduction, on the issue of democracy and the welfare state. I should say how surprised I was uh, many years ago as an undergraduate when I read Chomsky's comments on Aristotle, a Greek who was not a nobleman, but he had enough money to support his work as a philosopher, which meant that in a pre-industrial society based on subsistence level agriculture, that someone was doing the work for him. And he was an apologist of slavery, yet he made one of the most compelling and earliest cases for democracy and economic aid for the needy. It is a practical argument, a rational one. And art, cinema, literature, poetry provides emotional arguments that are persuasive or not in their own way. But as far as straightforward, rational arguments go, Aristotle is hard to beat, as we shall see. So... I read the politics for myself. Chomsky's uh, appraisal, Aristotle's argument is accurate, and we'll discuss the relevant passages here, and the reader can decide for himself or herself whether it's persuasive or not. First, why Chomsky and Aristotle? It was Noam Chomsky, who most of you probably heard of, who led me to read specifically Aristotle's politics, which is a travesty. As a classical philologist, which is the study of ancient Greece and Rome, I should have read him in graduate school. I mean, the man is not just one of the greatest philosophers, thinkers, writers, political theorists of the classical world, but of all time. And he was never assigned. And people wonder why so many people take issue uh, these days with the current state of humanities in, uh, in universities. So... I read Aristotle's politics almost as soon as I graduated with my PhD. And to be fair, most of what Aristotle has written is a bit unpolished, more like notes than, say, a polished literary masterpiece by Plato, but it's substance over style. And so it was time well spent reading the politics. So. I'll start off defining specifically d democracy as understood by Aristotle, and like with his work on ethics, specifically the Nicomachean ethics, it clarified a lot and was worth my time, and it would be worth your time if you have not read anything by Aristotle. I would direct you to the most relevant passages, though. He can be a bit of a chore to get through. He, he doesn't, I wouldn't call it rambling, it's just his works are in the form of notes. They're not polished literary masterpieces like Plato. I will briefly introduce Chomsky and Aristotle and then define the term democracy, especially as Aristotle understood it in the context of ancient Greece, and then I will define the welfare state. And the main purpose of this presentation is to lay out Aristotle's argument and allow the listener to decide its merits for him or herself, and how persuasive it is. Most people will be familiar with Dr. Chomsky from his political activism, and his comments here pertain to political theory, not his work in linguistics. But he was employed as a scientist at MIT, as a linguist, and his work, Syntactic Structures, revolutionized the field. I have not read the work. It's far removed from my own field of expertise, but to sum it up briefly as best I can, it refutes the blank slate of John Locke, the idea that humans acquire their knowledge, all knowledge through observation, through their senses, empirically, through observation and perception. The nativists are cognitive, philo cognitive philosophers and thinkers and scientists who refute that and say there is some built-in learning systems. Language is an example of one of them. There seems to be some built-in capacity to pick up language as children don't have much experience and yet they're able to identify sentences from their language. So there is kind of an innate ability there. Steven Pinker built on Chomsky's work. I mentioned him in the second video. And it's interesting how many of these linguists are 
became famous for doing stuff besides uh, linguistic work. So anyways, the focus here is the article I read, um, an excerpt from a book written by Chomsky, uh, his comments on Aristotle. That took about 900,000 takes to get through. Uh, if you haven't read any work in linguistics, it's hard to just summarize it all of a sudden. It does make me want to read some tactic structures, though, because as a person that studies languages, to get to the science matter of it is, is interesting. But uh, And I may return to that in a later presentation, but yeah, that was rough. But hopefully I didn't confuse uh, any listeners more than I just confused myself. Science in the West can trace its roots to the natural philosophers, as they were called, of ancient Greece who sought natural rather than religious explanations to explain natural phenomena. This was a big development. In time, philosophy went from those matters into matters of the community, uh, such as ethics and values. And we see moral philosophy emerge with Socrates of Athens, who unfortunately didn't write anything down, but his student, Plato, who was the instructor of Aristotle, collected his thoughts as, as they were um, in his, his dialogues, his discussions with Athenians, um, in his uh, literary dialogues. But he himself did not write anything down. But there is a lineage from Socrates to Aristotle. Aristotle, as I said, was a polymath, a voluminous author, philosopher, biologist, zoologist, political theorist, etc. His work under discussion today is the politics. As Chomsky himself states, this work by Aristotle serves as the foundation for all subsequent political theory. Aristotle and his students documented the constitutions of 158 states. Most of them were Greek, some were not. For example, Carthage. Unfortunately, he didn't look at Rome, which would have been interesting. Rome at this time was growing. It was not an empire quite yet. It was a growing regional power. The best state in Aristotle's politics, in his view, is the city-state. Rome was a city-state. Rome agreed. And they view their empire then and later as essentially a network of city-states, but they were a little bit more generous with their citizenship than most Greek states who jealously guarded the privileges of citizenship. So it would have been interesting to see Aristotle's view on the Roman constitution and their commonwealth. What was the methodology used in politics? He approaches politics as a practical science, as opposed to a hard science like biology, or an applied science, if I'm using that term correctly, like psychiatry or analytical psychology. He wanted to find out what constituted a good government, what was a bad government, and what factors played into those uh, types of government. For the good government, he concludes that stability, constitutionalism, and uh, the well-being of its citizens characterize good governments as opposed to bad governments. But what factors lead up to that? In my view, Aristotle is indeed a scientist. And I'm sure you've come across people, I came across them in academia, who will, you know, nitpick and troll everything you say. That's kind of the job of academics is to problematize the truth. And I forget who said, I think it was Frank Herbert and Dune who said the truth suffers from too much analysis. But good analysis serves its purpose. But I'm, I'm sure you've met people who just won't, I use that term loosely, who just won't allow you to talk. You know what I mean? Who will not allow you to generalize about anything. And it does become difficult to even talk when you can't even make at least rational generalizations. You know, they'll provide the one exception as if that proves anything. But anyways, so for me, Aristotle is a scientist, at least when he's doing science, like when Plato is doing philosophy. He's a philosopher, not when he's doing mysticism. And so I could be mistaken about what Aristotle means and purports to do with a theory, what, with, you know, his, epist his epistemology. But, you know, I have heard people say, yeah, but Justin, Aristotle, he's not a scientist. He doesn't have a degree from a modern university. And it's like, I know morons. I'm talking about someone who lived 2,000 effing years ago. At the very least gratitude. We stand on the shoulders of our prede predecessors. I forget who it was, I don't know, Descartes or Sir Francis Bacon. We stand on the shoulders of giants. So Aristotle, I, I agree with this. I, I'm definitely not a scientist. <laughs> you know, I, I'll agree. I, I'm definitely not a scientist. This, this is not what I do. 
but uh, Aristotle, at the, at the very least, is a predecessor. And what he's doing here is practical science. He presents a, an argument to us in the politics. It's a syllogism, a valid argument, with a supporting premise, and like I noted, a mountain of data derived from observation. With that said, with that concluded, whatever that was, it, I, again, I could be wrong about this, about uh, his epistemology, which would make my outburst just now even more embarrassing. But with that said, uh, let's move on to what democracy means. There are essentially three kinds of government. Rule by one, rule by few, and rule by the many. And in the Greek view, government was cyclical. So a government, when the rot sets in, it could regress into its corrupt equivalent, respectively tyranny, oligarchy, which is just ruled by the rich, whether they're cultivated or educated or moral. It's irrelevant. It's just how much property do you have? And then the last one, uh, democracy could devolve into mob rule, which could become as tyrannical as an actual tyranny or oligarchy. So democracy, the subject of this presentation, is ruled by, it, the term actually specifically means ruled by the free people. That is the people who are not slaves. And so I know more about the Roman constitution. And so in their mind, if you were not a slave, then you had to be a citizen. So they did award citizenship to freedmen. And the Romans did manumit quite a few slaves, so many that there was actually regulations in time to limit uh, manumission. Also, I don't quite understand the distinction between slaves and women. So women were not allowed to participate in government. But if you were a woman, if you were a woman, and you could trace your lineage back multiple generations, you're, you shouldn't be treated the same as a POW, someone who invaded you know, your lands, it was taken prisoners, as many slaves were, uh, as, as many people became slaves through being captured in war. You're not quite the same, and I've never quite understood that. So, the welfare state is a state that safeguards the well-being of its citizens. To quote Encyclopedia Britannica, which is a more reliable source than Wikipedia, to say the least, and it seems to actually be an encyclopedia, it gets to the point it's based on the principles of equality of opportunity, equitable distribution of wealth. That I don't get, unless they mean if you have wealth, it's the gains are not ill-gotten. In other words, you didn't break the law to acquire it. So, equality of opportunity, equitable, equitable distribution of wealth, and public responsibility for those unable to avail themselves of the minimal provisions for a good life. So, ironically, Otto von Bismarck, uh, the conservative statesman of Germany, very competent, definitely knew what he was doing, but it, it, he was a conservative who did not like socialists. He ended up co-opting some of their ideas to undercut their power, and in Germany, late 19th century, he he instituted pensions, accident insurance, health care, and uh, unemployment insurance, and so I guess Germany led the way then, correct me if I'm wrong, but the United Kingdom, uh, I guess their welfare programs were more stable and are still around today. So the United Kingdom, after World War II, then led the way, especially with their national health insurance and national insurance. In the United States, of course, we have the very popular Medicare. And it is funny how some people who have a pathological disdain for these kinds of policies benefit them, since, you know, our, health, our Medicare covers those age 65 and above, and people tend to get more conservative as they age, because they have more resources, and I get that. So, um, the point here is we're looking at Aristotle's arguments for democracy and for the welfare state, and since you can't have, you can't have, in his view, democracy without welfare. That's why I'm defining both democracy and the welfare state. So, Otto von Bismarck is definitely not a bleeding heart liberal. Neither was Aristotle. But in Aristotle's view, a constitutional democracy was among the most stable governments, but in his view, in his argument, it wasn't possible if you had a huge mass of desperately needy poor people. So that's why we're looking at his argument for democracy in addition to his argument for a, a certain welfare program, which he outlines a number of options. That dangerous radical, Aristotle by Noam Chomsky, excerpt from The Common Good, 1998. So, scrolling down to Aristotle. Uh, 
So he says, that title was given to me. I started at the beginning of political theory with Aristotle's politics, which is the foundation of most subsequent political theory. Chomsky then says, Aristotle took it for granted that, and it is difficult to know what is taken for granted if an ancient author doesn't mention it, and I've encountered this difficulty before. Um, but sometimes it's helpful, like when you study the Roman army, what the Greek Polybius doesn't say, um, it's probably something that the Greek and Greeks and Romans do alike, so he doesn't point it out. So he says, Aristotle took it for granted that a democracy should be fully particip participatory, meaning you've got all male citizens with a vote and can run for office and so forth, except women and slaves. And that it should and that it should aim for the common good which is as we will look at later this is eudaimonia the well-being prosperity happiness to achieve that it has to ensure relative equality moderate sufficient property lasting prosperity so aristotle felt that if you have extremes of poor and rich you can't talk seriously about democracy any true democracy has to be what we call today a welfare state, actually an extreme form of one far beyond anything envisioned in this century. And see, this is interesting. Aristotle, Greek, 2,000 years ago, would be denounced today as a dangerous radical. That's embarrassing, but let's read on. Aristotle also made the point that if you have a, in a perfect democracy, a small number of very rich people and a large number of very poor people, the poor will use their rights to take away property from the rich. He regarded this as unjust. So you got two solutions, reducing poverty or reducing democracy. Now this is where it gets really interesting. So he compares his thoughts, Aristotle's thoughts to James Madison, who uttered the phrase to protect. The primary goal of government is to protect the minority of the opulent against the majority. I would like to read the Federalist Papers and know a little bit more about Madison's argument than just to go by one line, but so I, I indeed he said it though, that is what he said. And it is kind of ominous, it's a bit chilling, to protect the minority of the opulent against the majority. Where is the middle class here? And the opulence of the minority, like it, of course it should be protected from uh, uh, the mob, but not if they, not if they acquired their opulence illegally. And I can also see, well, and as I'll demonstrate, there's arguments for um, sharing some of the opulence, because if you don't, one of those rich persons, like, you know, what happened with the Roman Republic, might use the desperate majority against the, against their own class uh, demagoguery. Okay, so with that, uh, so there's the website. You can read this for yourself. With that said, we'll delve into uh, passages from the politics. Aristotle viewed nature teleologically. That means he views human existence in nature uh, with a purpose. There is some purpose for our being, which is to aim for and strive for eudaimonia, which can be translated as prosperity, happiness, true happiness, opulence. In this sense, it means, I would say, perfect and true well-being. It's important and it underlies his work on ethics, the Nicomachean ethics. So any good government should aim for eudaimonia within reason and for as many of its citizens as possible. And to underscore why this is important, he argues famously in the next line that human beings are political animals. Man is by nature a political animal. His point is that humans have the habits of beings accustomed to society, and we are born into a society, and unlike most animals, humans indeed are dependent upon their society because, I mean, most animals are ready to fight for their survival almost immediately, but human infants are pretty vulnerable. We also have this unique capacity for reason. Um, 
correct me if I'm wrong, it's, you know, we have the R complex, we have the, uh, the mammalian brain, the, the limbic system, if I'm not mistaken, then we also have our well-developed um, prefrontal lobes and cerebral cortex. Uh, again, as I've stated before, this is not my field, cognitive science, and the Greeks wouldn't know the science behind it either, uh, but they could recognize the symptoms. And if I'm getting all of this brain stuff wrong, uh, feel free to annihilate me in the comment sections. But the the point is, what I'm trying to state here is that I, I agree, at, le at least in part, that like we are, at least for part of our lives, without question dependent on society. Those habits ingrained, uh, Stephen Pinker says, in you know, some of these habits ingrained in our genes, others, you know, the nature versus nurture debate. But this idea of man being a political animal, being a social animal, is also important to the whole idea of values. Uh, as Plato talks about, why have values at all? Why have virtues and vices? It's because men are born differently, uh, with, with different abilities. They're not totally dependent. They are born into society and depend on society and have different skills, so you'll have to interact with people might as well do so with reason and deficiency. Does the statement sound like an oxymoron? It did to me at first, and then I realized, no, oh, that's that about sums it up, actually. There's hierarchies everywhere, if you look in the natural world, hierarchies everywhere. And I do believe, I don't believe I know that humans are indeed animals, but not every animal is unique to the same degree. And so, uh, bees have a monarchy, but they're not self-aware. You know, they didn't agree to it. You know, there wasn't a bee that said, uh, let's have democracy. And then another bee stands up heroically and says, do you see how the way we act? We're just buzzing around all the time. If we're a democracy, we're not going to get anything done. Monarchy or be damned, and everyone applauds, and the monarchy is fat. No, it's, it's like it's hard wired into their genes, kind of like what Pinker was talking about with uh, our own genes and the ability to learn language. And then even looking at our, our closest animal relative, uh, chimpanzees, if you ask a chimpanzee, the alpha male in particular, uh, hey, uh, you tyrannical bastard, uh, why are you not using your power to write a constitution? You know, why don't you put on your George Washington wig and sit down, write a constitution, and maybe prevent some of these violent, angry fights, sometimes brutal, ones that Jane Goodall saw and was appalled by, uh, when there's, you know, a change of government. Why not have a peaceful transition of government? And, you know, he's not going to respond to you. He may throw crap at you or something. I can see him putting on the... <laughs> I can see him putting on the wig, the George Washington wig, but not sitting down and writing a constitution. Uh, he's not self-aware. The statement may sound ox like an oxymoron, but it does make sense. We are self-aware, conscious, and uh, we are animals, but not all animals are exactly unique in the same way. If the state is a partnership, as he argues, Every state is a partnership, a sort of partnership, and every partnership is formed with a view to some good, since all the actions of mankind are done with a view to what they think to be good. So the point is, is that the state is a partnership. Humans do this by nature, and with reason it should aim for eudaimonia, the true happiness that's a functioning and good government. And I should also say the... The state, the partnership of the state is kind of like, no, it, the family is like a microcosm of the state. And the community, the larger community, is sort of like a network of families uh, that are operating in a kind of partnership. So briefly, Aristotle does not agree with Plato and Plato's ideal communistic society in the Republic. He does believe private property is better for a number of reasons. People take care of private property better than commonly held property, and people may fall into strife when people's contributions are unequal, and then even more so when their contributions are unequal and their consumption of said common property is also unequal. You know, when people don't work as hard as 
the, their neighbor. Um, so nothing wrong with self-interest that aligns with the pursuit of aodaimonia until it becomes selfish, which is then a an excess in not in moderation. And that was the key principle in a lot of Aristotle's thought was moderation, moderation and without excess. And I was just browsing through Wikipedia looking at the statement by Jefferson, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And, I mean, these are ancient ideas, you know, and they were noting that there was two different hypotheses on where Jefferson got the term, whether it was um, from Locke or someone else. And you see all these various, you know, thinkers and philosophers from the 16th and 17th centuries, but it's like these are, these are, these ideas are so ancient. And Americans, with their exceptionalism, you, you have to think about this. If the ideas that are in the Constitution are so reasonable, then reasonable men would have used them before. If they're good ideas, and you have people like geniuses like John Locke and Aristotle think, and Cicero thinking about these things, they're not just going to suddenly appear out of nowhere in the 18th century when sophisticated political systems like Republican Rome and Athenian democracy have already come before them. And the Constitution borrows a lot of good ideas. Um, it, it is, in a sense, original in that there's not and was not another U.S. Constitution, but the ideas, and this will be definitely a presentation I'll do later, but the ideas in many cases, at least the key principles, are very old. A fundamental principle of democracy is liberty, which Aristotle defines as living as one likes, with reason. This is the common theme here. He further quali well, it is, it's, it's not just liberty, you know, it's with reason, responsibility, all these things, not only liberty, you know. So he further qualifies this by saying that one factor involved in democracy is to govern and in turn be governed, the majority will sovereign. So that means that one party, one man can't just rule indefinitely. So to read directly, a fundamental principle of the democratic form of constitution is liberty. This is the aim of every democracy. And one factor of liberty is to govern and be governed in turn. You know, in other words, taking turns, allowing other people to run for the offices of state. For the popular principle of justice is to have equality according to number, not worth. And if this is the principle of justice prevailing, then the multitude the multitude must of necessity be sovereign, and the decision of the of the majority must be final and constitute justice. So both the Roman Republic and Athenian democracy were two kinds of representative government or democracy, which is a vast oversimplification. The Roman Republic was closer to an elective oligarchy than anything resembling a democracy, and indeed the Founding Fathers drew a sharp distinction between those two, not mentioning the word democracy once in the Constitution for the United States. So it's not here the place to go into details, but talking about a citizen in both Greece and Rome, it meant um, that you, as stated before, not a slave, not a woman, you are a man of adult age, and you can participate in politics, you can run for office, serve on jury court, serve or be present in political assemblies that, that voted on legislation and declared war. I'm thinking more along the lines of the Committee Cantoriata in the Roman Republic, that which I am more familiar with. And there everyone voted, which was different than the U.S. Constitution, which did not give the vote to many people who did not have sufficient property. Everyone had the vote in, in Greece and Rome, but they didn't count the same because they voted in bloc, and the blocks were rated higher based on property. So regardless of the type of government, whether it is monarchy, aristocracy, democracy, it's unjust when you initiate force and take other people's property. So Aristotle asks the reader, is it just when the minority and the rich should rule and suppose they plunder and take away the property of the multitude, is that just? And also conversely, is it right for the multitude, since they outnumber the rich in a democracy and uh, everyone takes their turns 
ruling and the multitude can vote a certain way is it just that they plunder the property of the well-to-do. He argues that it is unjust and he's correct and Chomsky also, whether he agrees or not, he notes it in his argument and indeed it is because it's unstable. It leads to strife and instability but he does offer a solution. Now we have reached the issue of crime and poverty. Aristotle is generalizing to a degree here but he is correct in that a large portion of your population that is extremely destitute and desperate, that's dangerous because demagogues can use that to their advantage. And again, I know more about Roman history, but you see the large body of uh, landless poor, the proletariat, who had understandably no loyalty to the state because there was no hope or anything reprieve from them, so they would just join generals like uh, Pompey and Julius Caesar, who then overthrew the state. He is not saying that virtuous people, like for example, my grandparents were very poor during the Great Depression. In fact, if you're an American my age, you'll, your grandparents probably lived through the Great Depression and suffered a great deal. Mine were quite poor on both sides of the family. And they didn't just say, you know, as soon as they missed their first rent payment, it's like F life, man. I'm now going to resort to a life of crime and cheat, steal, and kill, you know. No, of course not. I mean, Aristotle is just pointing out that it is dangerous to have a large portion of your population that is extremely destitute and effing pissed off, man. The aristocracy in Rome, like, I understand where they were coming from, but they really didn't do anything. And so when the landless poor then went to the likes of Julius Caesar and Pompey and Crassus, it's like those were their benefactors, and then they used them, took advantage of them, to then overthrow the Republic. So it is something to be, you don't have to be a bleeding hard liberal to deal with the issue in a practical manner, to be a man of reason and deal with the, the problem. So one of the solutions he records for dealing with the uh, the cyclical nature of government, you know, democracy going to mob rule or aristocracy going to oligarchy, and then also the to safeguard against the tyranny of the majority, to safeguard against crime, sedition. We'll get to the welfare state in a moment, but this was one of his important ideas that the Greeks loved and talked about very frequently. It is the mixed constitution which is very similar and indeed likely influenced the concept, uh, Montesquieu's concept of of separation of powers, uh, the checks and balances, the different, the three branches of the government, and there's three types of government that the Greeks thought existed, democracy, oligarchy, monarchy, and then there's the three branches of government in our constitution, executive, legislative, judicial. And so there's this lineage of ideas that goes back to this concept of the mixed constitution. And Rome, Sparta, Carthage were examples of this in the Greek opinion. So Aristotle writes, uh, and, and the idea of, of a, a mixture, a, a moderate reasonable mixture to where you kind of find a middle ground between two extremes, this is an important part of his ethics, the Aristotelian mean, the golden mean. But anyways, he writes, this then is the mode of the mixture, and the mark of a good mixture of democracy and oligarchy is when it is possible to speak of the same constitution as a democracy and as an oligarchy, for manifestly this is so when it is said because they have been mixed well, and this is the case with the form that lies in the middle. So here are the the most pertinent passages uh, from Aristotle and his thoughts on welfare. He writes, The truly democratic states, statesman must study how the multitude may be saved from extreme poverty, for this is what causes democracy to become corrupt. Measures must therefore be contrived that they may bring about lasting prosperity. He then goes into very specific details. Since this is advantageous, this program that he's, this idea that he's talking about, is advantageous for the well-to-do who are members of a democratic society. The proper course is to collect it all, uh, the, all the proceeds of the revenues into a fund, distribute this in lump sums to the needy, but here he does argue that it's it may be better to uh, s sort of set them up like an investment. I'm sure there's stats somewhere on this, but um, it, it, welfare uh, or just helping people out who are 
maybe skilled, you know, they just uh, got unlucky or for whatever reason. It is like an investment. It is practical and smart. And so here he offers a solution in the context of ancient Greece that is, best of all, if one can, in sums large enough for acquiring a small state, or failing this to service capital for trade or husbandry, and he goes on to talk about how to distribute the money. Aristotle is focusing on the practicality, which I, I find to be, it's, it's one of the most effective arguments, but it's not the only argument that would persuade people. It's like some people are just motivated by genuine empathy and compassion. Some people don't, are not moved by that. Okay. This works though. The idea of, of an investment and at the very least, and he's talking about like a city state like Athens, that it's about 30,000 people. Um, especially in that case, at the very least, prevent demagogues from gaining too much power and corrupting the system. So I guess Aristotle would be classified as middle class. And as a student in high school, I always thought middle classes, you know, only came about with the Industrial Revolution. But if you're not the landless proletariat and you're not an extremely wealthy landowner with like about 3,000 slaves, then you're somewhere in the middle. And I guess Aristotle, not being a nobleman himself, was middle class. But his argument for a democracy is you need the middle class, in particular in this like idea of the mixed constitution, which combines elements of democracy and oligarchy. The middle class is useful as a buffer between the rich and poor and balances those two extremes out. He writes, where the number of the middle class exceeds both the extreme classes together, or even one of them only, here it is possible for a constitutional government to be lasting. There is a lot in this sentence that is way ahead of its time. He's talking about a society that does not resemble a pyramid. It's like most ancient civilizations look like a pyramid, you know, with a few wealthy people atop, the king at the top, and then a, a mass of serfs below. And then he's also talking about constitutionalism. He was a constitutionalist long before the Founding Fathers. And so, like, that is a key principle in his ideas of government is a stable constitution as well. Aristotle lists a number of advantages that democracy has over oligarchy. This one spoke to me the most. He writes, Democracy is safer and more free than civil strife than oligarchy, for in oligarchies two kinds of strife spring up, faction between different members of the oligarchy and also faction between the oligarchs and the people, whereas in democracies only strife between the people and the oligarchical party occurs. Again, to return to Rome, the disappearance, the destruction of the small farmer class through overseas conquests resulted in a type of pyramid society where you had a large mass of poor people, slaves, proletariat, artisans, and the oligarchs, and when the oligarchs fought each other, the demagogues uh, made use of the desperate people under them, and the result was some bloody civil wars. The factional disputes between the Roman oligarchs, the, the great families, uh, were civil. Their competition for offices to serve in the Republic were civil until the middle class was destroyed. If you want to call it the middle class, the small farmers. So that goes back to Aristotle's argument in the previous slide. So in conclusion, and not necessarily in the order that I covered them, the main points that Aristotle is arguing about democracy and about the welfare state. So the middle class is important to help balance the extremes of poor and rich and to serve as a buffer between these two classes in a democracy. Democracies are among the most stable types of constitutional governments in between aristocracy and monarchy, as there's only there's there's limited strife as occurs between the oligarchs and the people, whereas in an oligarch you have factional disputes between the oligarchs and disputes between the mass of people excluded from government since it's only based on the wealthy and nobles. And it's worth reading the politics to see his arguments for and against um, all the, the governments, because it's quite fascinating. Uh, the mixed constitution, again, this Aristotelian mean, you know, find a balance. And so uh, some things monarchy does well, same for aristocracy and same for 
democracy, and he looks at constitutions that kind of balance the best elements of those three. And for this reason, I would have been interested in what he would have said about the Roman Republic. Uh, but he does praise Carthage and Crete and Sparta, which were these types of constitutions that seem to contain elements of monarchy, oligarchy, and democracy. And this was an idea that would last a very long time, and we can kind of see elements of this in the U.S. Constitution with the balance of powers and uh, the, the different branches of government. And in a democracy, as Aristotle argues, you must have liberty that is fundamental. Um, a constitution, again, Aristotle was a constitutionalist long before the Founding Fathers, uh, as I concluded with the welfare state, got to reduce poverty as far as possible by any means you can to prevent uh, really desperate people. Uh, you know, can't reduce all crime to nil. I don't think that's possible. He's not arguing for that. He's just saying you can minimize strife and the corruption of a democracy by keeping the demagogues at bay who will take advantage of destitute people. As always, thanks for listening, and visit the website for uh, more written articles and downloads, audio and video. So, uh, most of the videos that I have there are on YouTube, uh, since I believe this is only my third one, and I'm not exactly sure what my my next one will be. I just read Dracula's, uh, Bram Stoker's Dracula, and I was thinking about... Um, looking into the symbolism behind that work, but first two were on the Roman army, that's my field, but I love Greek philosophy and I do love classical, great classical literature, so I may uh, do uh, that next, but in any case, again, thanks for listening.